as a beta test for this digital ID thing. So you can add your, your ID. And the reason is that the world starts with the USA to scan IDs. It's simple. The USA screwed up. They did. They gave everybody a driver's license, which is, which is fine. And, and that's not the weird part. But it doesn't contain a chip. And it almost doesn't contain any security features. This is no advice, but the American driver's licenses are the easiest to copy in the whole world. Thank you all. Uh, as I said, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm going to talk to you about, some people think it's quite boring, passports, driver's licenses, all kind of identifications, means of identifications. These are my own passports. My name is Rutger. I'm an Android developer at a software agency called New Nexus. Um, I do not have a cool story about working at a startup, but, but we do really nice things for all kinds of customers, which you maybe do know or maybe do not know because they are all Dutch, so who knows. Um, I'm going to, to talk about you about passports and the future about passports. I'm not going to dive into code. So if you want to have a deep dive into code of passports, then you're probably in the, in the wrong room, but let's see where we get from there. One of our clients that I would like to, to, to highlight, because it's the client I work at the most at the moment, is Just Dig It, which is an African NGO. And I'm not here to promote things. I really ain't. It will come back to the story later on. But um, it's a cool NGO where we target 325 million farmers in Africa to regreen their lands. And then it snapped again, because before this, I worked at uh, the biggest phone selling company of the Netherlands. And we sold sus subscriptions for phones, like data bundles, uh, phone numbers, all kinds of things. And due to laws and legislations, uh, according to terrorism, we have to ID every customer that wants to buy a subscription. So if you want to have a subscription, you have to show your passport. If you want to have a new phone number, you have to show your passport or your driver's license or whatever document that, that says who you are. So we run into problems, and I'm happy that there is finally a solution. And Google made it a real big thing. It will be a really big thing in your life in a, in, in a couple of years. But they managed to not show it in Google I.O. at all. They mentioned something in like half a sentence. That's it. But it will impact all of your lives probably in the, in the next few years. So I would like to see some hands. And I'm not into the communication because I'm already happy that I dropped the letter C from ICT and they switched it to IT. But let me show some hands if you have a passport at all. See quite some hands. And if anybody doesn't know what a passport is, is this booklet quite small, but it never fits in your pocket. And if you're a woman with fake pockets in your pants, because that's, I don't know, industry standard, then you cannot, you cannot put your passport with you. But you need it all the time, because you have to ID yourself. So it will be a classical presentation. We have a problem, we come with a solution, and then we are going to tell like, what's the protocol of that solution, so you can use it as well. And that's it. Not too much. So let's first talk about identity. And I really hate a lot of text on slides, but otherwise I forget the text myself. But everybody over here has an identity. You have curls, it's your eye color, it's your name, when you're born, where you're born. Um, all the features, physical features, but also like the administrative stuff. Because, to be honest, a date of birth is just a construct that is thought of because somebody was like, oh, let's start a calendar. We need a calendar. Otherwise, we do not know when we are, have to show up on work or when we don't. But everybody has an identity over here. And because of that identity, you can use that uh, to identify people, to know who they are. If you rob a bank, then it would be nice if we can find you. Um, if you are selling cocaine, it would be nice 
to find you, not to buy it, but to, to, to look, just to be sure, just to be sure. If you do, though, we are going to talk about passports. That's the next slide. Make sure you have a diplomatic one, because if you have a diplomatic passport, you probably have God mode on, on the world. They will not check your bags at the airport. It's forbidden, because it's, it can contain secrets of your country. But most people, I don't think, it, anybody here with a diplomatic passport? It says diplomatic, I don't think so. If it does, you can earn a lot of money. So a passport is basically this booklet. And that booklet is the same everywhere in the world, basically. So I'm lucky to be a dual citizen. So I have, I have two. A red one, which you mostly have if you're living in Europe or in former Soviet states. Or a blue one, when the British ever attacked you into your country. <laughs> then you get a blue. Or when you went to the Brexit, you went to, to red to blue. Um, you can also have a black passport. Some countries have a black passport. They are rare. So if you have a black passport, like in New Zealand, then you can flex it everywhere. Um, but these things are meant to, to have an official status to show who, who you are. Because if you have a name, I don't know, a real Italian name? Marco or something? Someone called Marco? I see multiple people, so that's nice. So if you're born on the same date, on the same day, and you have the same features, then it's already hard to distinguish Marco from Marco. So the ICAO, which is part of the United Nations, thought of, well, let's have a document. But we need to standardize it. Otherwise, it is... Yeah, it's different all over the world. And if you need to travel, some countries include these fields and some countries include other fields. In the, in the past, it wasn't the case. Then you got a letter from your king and you got on your horse and you went to another country. And in that letter, it stated, therefore, the king asked to let this person through. And in a lot of passports, including the Dutch one on the first page, it still says like, this passport, uh, this, this guy basically wants to enter your country, and I'm the king, and I would like to not have trouble with you, so please let him through. That's basically it. So a passport, this is a Dutch passport, but the Italian one is uh, pretty similar, I guess. Other colors, a bit of other picture, but it's all the same. And these things look like this because they have all kinds of security features. So they, for example, have, and now I'm going to test a new thing with my clicker. Is it working? No, it ain't. Never mind. Um, these things have, like, the, your passport in grayscale. It has another picture of you, smaller. And in the, in, in the Netherlands, it's like a 3D picture. So if you tilt your passport, it will show up differently. It has your signature, because somebody thought once, like, a signature, that's something, how we can distinguish people. But if you look at this signature for two hours, I'm pretty sure you can make it yourself. So, it also had hidden features. This is when you put a passport underneath UV light. And if you think this is a really st long story about passports, we will come to the clue later on. So this is like UV light. And in some countries, you will see your own face again. It, it, that, that part differs a bit. But the most important thing is this symbol. This kind of box with a circle in the middle. Because that means that you have a digital passport. And almost all countries have a digital passport at the moment. And the digital passport has a lot of features. Because it has to be a secure thing. You do not want to have your passports breached. Because if your passports get breached, somebody will create fake passports. And that happens on great scale, really great scale. But we have to make that as difficult as possible for obvious reasons. I mean, there, there are passports already for years because uh, of protection, identification, uh, but also just to see who someone is when you are at your municipality. If you gave birth to a new kid, you want to register the kid. And then it shouldn't be the case that you can register a kit for your neighbor because you do not have like a real document. Um, but this one has flaws because you can already see some, some arrows around. Because it, I split it up in the blue part and in the green part. So the blue part is the physical part. That's the part that you can see right here. That's the booklet. And the green part is the digital part. 
So, it, yeah, your passport also has a chip that contains your information. Everything that you can read is also on a chip, plus your picture will be in full color instead of on grayscale for some reason. Um, and that's there, including fingerprints. If you gave fingerprints, there will also be fingerprints. Uh, some countries also register your hair color of your, or your color or the, of your eyes, or your, even your length, or your spouse. So that's there. But the weird thing is, as you could see on the errors on the previous slide, is that you have to unlock that chip with a password. And that password is on the physical side. So if you want to read automatically the chip, you can't because it's locked with the password that is on the side. So you have to combine in the machine readable zone, that is that gibberish underneath with that uh, funky font. You have to combine the document number, you have to combine the date of birth, and you have to combine the, valid, uh, the expiry of the document. That together is like a password to the NFT chip. So I used to make an SDK. It was called Verify, where we uh, combined those things, where we could scan a passport, like we could read the test. We had to train our own OCR model, because OCR, that means like reading the letters from, from a document. But every time you capture on Google, you're translating books, and those things are getting used to train, train readability uh, of OCR. But these are not books, so we could not use default reading solutions because it would keep coming back to words all the time. So we make this, uh, this SDK that solved our problem with selling subscriptions on the internet because people did not have to go to a store anymore, had to scan the ID, we could check if it is real, scan the NFC chip, and then go ahead. Because the NFC chip is the only thing we can validate if a document is real. Of course, the other things we, we, we check because it's really difficult to, to, to recreate, as you can see in this uh, video. And this was uh, one of the earlier versions, so the design wasn't that, but it's an SDK, so you could implement it uh, yourself. So if you have that NFC, it also contains certificates, and not only certificates from the from the um, company that gives you the document, because in some countries you have to buy your passport from a private company, which is affiliated to the state. And in other countries, you can uh, just ask your government. But it contains a whole tree of certificates and it can validate. So the SD an SDK like this, and there are many others like Stripe, and you will see them, see them in banking apps wherever, they just read your NFC and then they handshake the, or they check the whole certificate chain to see if it's valid. And if it's not valid, it's a counterfeit passport. Another nice thing is that if a passport gets breached, if someone hacked into the chip of a passport, they could remove the certificate from the no, validity list and then all those passports are not valid anymore. Big problem, with OCR you have sun. And if you're traveling to the sun like I did in it, to Italy, because in the Netherlands the weather is, uh, I cannot swear, right? But uh, the weather is not that good. You cannot read it anymore. You cannot, so you cannot get the passcode to the passport. And you also have what I call weird letters. In the Netherlands we only use a couple of letters, but I already see some hands like, what is a weird letter? I have it in my name, but I call it weird letters because in that machine readable code, we only use A till Z, Z. So it gets translated. But if you're going to read that machine readable code back, the name isn't right because you cannot translate it back. Because as you can see, the A and the E, uh, like the second one, the, a, the weird A thing is, they translate to the same, same letters in the MRC. So you cannot like brute force it back to, to get someone's name. And that's an issue. So, for passports, and for all kind of other documents. This is one from a uh, mail I got from uh, Austria. These are all specimen documents, so fake documents, so if you're going to photograph them and try to order something from the internet, it probably won't work. If it does, good for you, but these are fake documents. So there are a lot. It's not just the passport like you and I have. There are also like military booklets. It are diplomatic booklets, you have IDs for yourself, you have 
IDs for refugees that do not have a citizenship status yet, but you want to ID them because they came here without any means of identification. But, yeah, a lot of problems arise there because people are forgetting their documents a lot. They just have Apple Pay, Google Pay, whatever pay you call it. They have it on the phones, so why take a wallet? And this is not financial advice. It really is not. But if you have stocks in a wallet company, don't know, man. So, people keep forgetting these things. We cannot ID people anymore. So we want to have it in a phone. Because one other thing is we cannot read the code wherever we want. If you're at the airport, sometimes you have to scan your passport. You have to put your passport on a glass plate. And what it does, it reads that code, it tries to log in on your chip, and if the certificate validates, it will give you a green light. Maybe it is not an if-else check, that if the ticket name is the same as the, the one on your passport, then let them through. That's why airplane companies always ask, like, What's your real passport name? It's not that they care. They just want to sell seats. They don't, yeah, they don't really care. But if you don't put it in correctly, you will not get through the gate. So, we want to have a solution where we go from that booklet to the phone. Because everybody has a phone, but not everybody wants to carry a booklet. But we first need to better test that. Because I saw a lot of hands, a real lot of hands, and that accounts for the whole world that has passports. So we do not want to have a digital password right now because if somebody screws up in the code, which we all did, we all pushed some weird things to production, we all sent a notification to, to we sent hello world or worse things to, to our customers. We all did, we all did. So we first want to beta test it. And if we want to beta test that, it's easier to do it on another document. Another document that isn't valid for like 10, 15 years. A document that less people have, even though a lot of people have it, but it works differently in every country in the world. And it's just weird just that way, but it's nice for this use case. So what we can do is that if we go back to this, to this overview, where we have this physical part and this digital part, where we only use the physical part to quickly ID someone, like, yeah, you look that, like that guy, but if you have a twin, you know, nobody cares. Then, yeah. yeah, okay, go through. Bouncers, even in the night, they, don't, they probably don't look because it's too dark. Um, so we can uh, move that, because we only need that biographical MRZ line to hack into the passport or to link in, in the, by the way. So, let's get rid of that. I hope you liked the animation. It took me an hour. <laughs> we still have all the things we need. We have that biographical information, but then digital. We have visa information, and a visa, that's such a weird thing, man. You ask a country to ask, can I stay? And then it takes them 10 weeks, and they send you a mini passport back in like one page that you have to put into your passport. And you're like, you're welcome. And then they give you 200 euros or something, and then you're in. Oh, I went ahead already. Let's go back. Sorry, not done yet. So we also have the biometrics over there and the encryption. So we can put everything in the digital part. Only in the Netherlands, like 17 million people live there, and most of them have a passport. So what, why do we all need that plastic, all those coffers, all those antennas, all those random stuff that pollutes our earth. So Google came with, sorry if here is anyone from Google, but I think it's Google Wallet or Android Wallet or Wallet. They change the name like every three months, but it's here and this is the icon. And I had to log into a VPN to uh, download this video because it's only available in America. So please enjoy. It doesn't have sound, unfortunately. So you can add driver's licenses as a beta test for this digital ID thing to your wallet via a flow that I must say is, looks quite familiar to something from an earlier video, but we see it as a compliment. We don't care. So you can add your, your ID. And the reason is that the world starts with the USA to scan IDs. 
is simple. USA screwed up. They did. They gave everybody a driver's license, which is, which is fine, and, and that's not the weird part. But it doesn't contain a chip. And it almost doesn't contain any security features. So if you want to have, copy someone's driver's license or have a fake driver's license, this is no advice, but the American driver's licenses are the easiest to copy in the whole world. Almost. There are some other countries left. But this one looks valid. So, what it does, it adds your, your, your driver's license to your Google Wallet, which is nice because it's a secret. It's not that secret because I'm here in the spotlight in front of the camera, in front of people. Because it's, it's pretty much a better test to roll it out to ID cards, to vaccination cards, to passports, to all kinds of things. And they are not the only one. Google is ahead on that way. But you also have Samsung. And Samsung likes to recreate every app for some reason. Sorry if you're from Samsung, but please stop. Um, they like to recreate every app for some reason. So they also made their own wallet where you can add state IDs. And also Apple is adding support for, for driver's license. And, they are, and that's, that's quite easy because digital driver's licenses are all on the same ISO standard. It's called ISO. 18,013-5, you do not have to remember that, it will not be a surprise test uh, later on. But that's, that's, that's an easier part. But now, it's a bit weird. It's a bit weird, because some states are supporting only some wallets. And this is just the USA. And if the USA wins well, you're going to, they are going to roll out to, to other countries. So it might depend on what phone you buy them, <laughs> if your driver's license will be digital. And of course, in a couple of years, you can add all driver's license IDs, whatever, into your wallet. But I see, I saw someone like, no, 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 they have everything. They have everything, not my ID. Well, should they have your ID? Why, why should they have your ID? I think big tech already knows you better than, than your own wife does, probably. They do not have to need, need to know your ID. So it doesn't. They really don't. They really don't. Android made this whole thing open source. So that's really cool. So you can make ID cards and passports with the identity credential API. And I see you thinking, like, why should I make a passport or an ID card? Well, you don't. You really don't. But I'm pretty sure that there are people that make employee badges, student IDs, um, things for your soccer club, maybe. I don't know. It are all identity credentials. You have to show them somewhere so you can get in, so you can join the club. So it's open source. So you can put it in your own app. You can put your own backends to it. You're in complete control of the whole chain, so you do not have to follow these steps. If you want to do this, um, it's on the Google Wallet documentation part, somewhere hidden, and you have to contact someone from Google, and then you can create your own identity credential in the wallet, just because not everybody should be able to create a passport, of course. Um, yeah, and that thing, if you use the identity credential, it's not stored in the cloud or anywhere else. It's just stored on your device. Uh, and of course, the issuing party already knows all the data, so um, wouldn't worry too much about that. So it's identity credential. It's a Jetpack library, so it gets updated all the time. And it's on GitHub also. So it works quite easy. I mean, the interfaces are quite easy. I had quite a headache. I was lucky to be the first in the world to create a driver's license. Um, so we worked together with Google and some other companies to see like, how can we do this? And I was like the test person to see, to see if all the libraries are working as intended. And it went pretty well. And it only has three steps on the user's phone. So you have this identity credential store, which is pretty much a big uh, table, a database. It's just like a room database, but it's located via the hardware abstraction layer and a secure enclave on your processor. So it sits next to your uh, uh, passwords that you, that you save, and it only unlocks, it gives the encryption key not via the MRZ code, but via your biometrical features like face ID, 
or um, facial lock or your fingerprint, which are also only on your phone. And then it contains the identity credential objects and all those identity credential objects have personalization data. So that's like your hair color, your length, or your name, the name of your mother, the name of your father. Um, Sometimes some countries even save like occupation. Yeah, so you shouldn't switch too many times for occupation, I think, otherwise you have to buy a lot of passports. So we work together with the RDW, which is the, yeah, it's, it's part of the Dutch government. And they are handing out more than 11 and a half million driver's licenses to people in the Netherlands. And they also issue out of more than 15 million, which is quite insane because we only live with 17 million in the Netherlands. So they have uh, this, uh, this use case to register all the things. Like if you have a, a car, I don't know, nice Ferrari or something, you pay a lot of taxes, but you also register it at the RDW. Or your driver's license. So that's where we get. So you, got a, you can have a wallet. They choose to, at that moment, to not have it included into the wallet of big tech because they were like, I don't know, let's make it ourselves, which is cool. So um, this is my real document. I only changed some minor things, like a document number and my uh, personal service number. Otherwise, you could all like, get loans and stuff on my name. So I removed that. So what someone can do is authenticate via DigiD, and you probably won't know DigiD, but DigiD is a really nifty app that we have with the Dutch government where we can log in and access all our government things because the Dutch government wants to digitalize everything, so we have a, quite a cool system for that. And if your problem fits in the digital way, you can get your things and otherwise you're screwed. It it's stores them securely, as I said, and it's the world's first document of that kind. Another cool thing is that your driver's license will always be up to date. So if you just went to a new driver's test, I don't know, you want to try a tractor or something, and you pass a test, it can be a matter of minutes and you have your new driver's license. You do not have to go to your municipality, get a new picture, get a new card, spend 40 euros, I don't know what's what's over here, but in the Netherlands, I think I pay like 60 euros for a driver's license and like 20 euros for a new picture, so that's like 80 euros. Uh, you don't need to do that anymore. You just hit refresh, it gets your new driver's license, you're set. And it's all signed with the same certificates as that were in this booklet. So everything is securely stored in that secure enclave where only some parts of Android can talk to. Um, I'm kind of making it quite small now and not too difficult, but it's stored apart from your operating system. So your operating system cannot say like, hey man, I want to have that field to give that information. No, it first has to go through all kinds of sophisticated checks, including your biometrics. And then the easy part about this is that you can share it via QR codes. So, um, you can share it with your hotel, you can share it with wherever you want to share it, police. Maybe you don't want to share it with police, but if you need to share it with the police, they can just scan a QR code. It's really secure because it has a peer-to-peer -peer network between phones. It's not using public Wi-Fi or 4G, 3G, whatever, 5G, any G. It doesn't use any G. It just Wi-Fi connect, NFC, Bluetooth, and it's really privacy friendly because you can only you only have to send the fields that you want to send to that officer or whoever is checking your document. And there are no read errors. And that was the biggest issue that we have because we do not have to use a camera to scan a weird code that is glaring with sun or that there is dirt on or that is not like your real name. So that's really cool. It looks a bit like this. It's a bit older, this is a video from last year, but this video is not in the NDA anymore, so that's pretty cool. It's all in Dutch, but I will explain. It will ask you to put in a pin code within this app, twice of course, and then you have to agree to some gibberish, and you can say, I want to have my driver's license. You log in with the DigiDay, 
that's happening here. And this is how we do it in the, in the Netherlands. Basically, if you need anything from the government, and then you can log in. It has this fancy animation. Then it gets back. So you come from app to app. You got a token, and then you can communicate with your municipality or your state or whatever. So now I've got this driver license in my overview. And there is my data. That's my picture from like 12 years ago. Is there my gibberish signature and my categories. So if I just passed the test and everything went through the computer, I could just, on that spot, get my ID. So that's my face. I can zoom in, which I wouldn't recommend, but it's possible. And you can share it, as mentioned before. So that, I, think, I think it's quite cool. Not that because I made it, but it will change, as I said, everyone's thing. I don't know if this is correct Italian, but I did this talk in Berlin and it said stop polizai. And I was like, I cannot put it in because I, I'm in Italy right now. But the police has to check you. So they will get their own app where they can scan that QR code as explained and you can data transfer. And there is no internet connection set as before. So if they stop you in one of those tunnels here in the mountains, you cannot say like, hey man, I cannot send it to you. I have no coverage. No, it's not, that, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. But it will just send up a Wi-Fi direct between two phones. And as you can see on the phone on the right, it says data to request. So if someone from the police is stopping you, it can say, I want to have his first name, his date of birth, his driver's license, categories. I do not need all the other data. So it's fully GDPR compliant. Passports are not GDPR compliant if you're going to check someone. Is there anybody here staying in a hotel? Quite some people. Who had to show their passport or their ID? Yeah, the same amount of people, so that's, that's quite cool. Somebody will just take this passport, go to a flatbed scanner, they will scan the passport, they will print it, they will, or maybe forget your passport that was still <laughs> under the flatbed scanner, so you have to go back. Or they might lose the paper. So it would be nice if they can only get like my name, my picture, and my date of birth. I don't know what, what they need it for. Um, but yeah, that's possible. You can also like chain documents together. You could chain a lot of documents together. So if you have your driver's license and your driver's registration, Someone from the police can tick those boxes from those two documents. So you do not have to fumble underneath your bag to get a document that you only have to show like once every 10 years because uh, you drove four, uh, four kilometers an hour too fast. You can just check it. So this, I, I think it's quite cool. I think it's quite cool. So that's the solution to the problem we had. We can digitalize it and everybody has their own their own happy passport later on. First driver's licenses, and then ID cards, then passports. Passports, at least 10 years, I guess. Because there are laws. Luckily, there are laws. Some laws, you may think like, I don't know, but there are laws. For example, the European Union states that you can only be the owner of one driver's license. They cannot find a solution yet to that law. Because it makes sense that you cannot have many multiple driver's licenses. You can only have one because you need to add those new categories. But if, a, if you have a digital version, is it a new driver's license or is it the same one? And if you have a card, because the Dutch government made it really clear that they want to have the card for whoever wants it. And that can the digital version for whoever wants it. And that's your choice. But yeah, that's, that's, that's quite a thing. So, protocols. Let's talk protocols. Whoever is not familiar with the term is basically an agreement be between two parties. Let's, let's see how we give each other information or other things. It's this format. It's like at work, where you say like, it's this format. I want to have it every time in this format. And you get it in another format anyway. But at least it's on paper. So this is the paper. It's, a, it's an official ISO standard. So last year it was still in draft, but it has now been approved to be an amendment on the ISO standard we already have for drive slices. 
which make them digital. And if you want to know anything about driver's licenses, you can look this one up and see for yourself. I'm not going to read this all, but it basically states like what should be in a driver's license. If you like that, if you want to have like NFC scan your own driver's license, if you have a digital driver's license or your passports, you can, you can, but you get some bytes back that are encrypted, which you want to unencrypt with that code and it's all in here. Now there is an amendment because if I have a Dutch driver's license, I want to drive to Italy as well. And if I get stopped by the police here, then it should be able to read my driver's license. Therefore, we need agreements on how the data structure looks. Because countries did mess up. Like 20 years ago, there were like passports that, well, they didn't have a chip and all the formats were slightly different. So that's why you also still, if you're at the airport, you sometimes have these kind of passports to the left, all others to the right. And that's because all those to the left, or whatever size you're going, contain the same protocol. And it's all part of Jetpack security. That gibberish I just showed is part of Jetpack security, and you can implement it in your own app. So if you add employee badges, for example, I would really recommend this, because it is proven secure. And this is quite a flow chart, and uh, you probably cannot read it, but I didn't really know on how to put it in anything. As you could see, I'm not a designer, but at least I tried, I guess. So um, what the flow basically is, for dummies, is that you check if there is a new identity credential, and then you create the app, uh, uh, or the, the backend, I mean, creates a challenge, and the challenge is quite a for some, um, yeah, it's, it's all kind of uh, encrypted things. And if the challenge goes back to the hardware abstraction layer, to the secure enclave, the challenge gets uh, done by that part of the, uh, of the phone. And only that part can solve that challenge. It sends it all back and then said, oh, you passed the challenge, you passed the, 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 the code, you cracked the code, so this is probably the, the right phone. And then, they are sending data items, and every field is sent separately. So you can, in the future, maybe have a phone that only holds a document with a subset of your data, and not all the data. I don't know yet wherefore, but it's a possibility for in the future. I will speed up a bit because of time. Um, but um, the key thing in here is that it has a number of authentication keys. If you see, uh, I'm quite small for this person, but like in the middle, it says create X authentication keys. And these authentication keys are only valid, as it says, X times. So as an issuer, you can say like, I want to have this data field read five times at maximum, and then somebody has to refresh their document. And what happens is that it rotates all the encryption keys. It even uh, rotates the, the, the list of where the data is in. It's like a, a key value store, but it differs the locations of those. It rotates everything. It also writes some fake keys in the VLD hardware abstraction layer. So if anybody thinks it's a jackpot and it, it hits that fake key, it gets locked instantly for an X amount of hours. So that's basically how it works. So you just ask like, hey, I want to add a new document. Then it gets stored in the secured thingy, the secured enclave and it has some key value data source. Because the passport is really simple, right? It just shouldn't be correct, but it's really simple. It's just key value, hair color, blonde, I don't know, length, one meter, 70 or something. You can just put it in there. You can even add fields, which is really cool. Because of time, I will continue a bit because I want to talk about ethics as well, and I see already people uh, joining like, oh man, ethics, ethics. We are just developers. No, you're not. You're not just developers. These things should be handled with care. And if you are asked by a government, handle it with care. Because if possible, please prevent mass surveillance. And I know a lot of people are concerned about it. I, me, myself, I'm a bit less concerned because I know that the same, same info from this booklet is within that phone. But some people are like, oh man, we all get a digital ID and we will be a number for the worldwide government or whatever. Well, that's 
not the case. I mean, I don't know if you ever organized something. Yeah, the people organized here in the yellow shirts organized this. And it was probably already a challenge to get everybody on the same track. So if you want to combine the whole world to a superpower, it will be uh, a bit difficult. But um, if somebody ever asks you uh, to, prevent, to add things, always ask twice. Always ask your colleagues. If you're not fine with thing, talk to your manager, please. Or if you are the manager, talk to your employer. Or if you're the employer, then you're not, you do not like this, then yeah. I'm not saying I'm really against mass surveillance. I'm really against mass surveillance. That's what I want to say. But things like this can be misused for mass surveillance. For example, if you get something from a store and you need to check your ID every, every time and not just for, for getting some booze, then that's some weird things. You also have to make sure it's really secure. When we implemented this last year, we, we, we hired the best security companies in the world to test and also to create fake documents. Because it's not like a side project. You are uh, having power about, and that sounds really weird, but it's like a power construct. You have power about everybody's identity if you screw up. If the app crashes one day and everybody cannot go through the airport, yeah, that's, that's, that's messed up. That's where a booklet comes in easier because <laughs> it, just, it just works. And you should think about the loss of freedom. Loss of freedom is a really big thing. And as a developer, you cannot... You are probably, you're not in charge on who is going to cross borders. But that's not it. As I said before, if you manage to break someone's identity, that's a loss of freedom for them. So you really have to test the app a lot. Really test the documents and always have like a fallback available. So I would recommend that if you have ever a digital ID, you also want like a booklet for if your phone is dead, for example. So on that uh, happy note, <laughs> I'm going to close. I use a nice stock image of cars because it was about drive slices and passport as well. It are secretly the same document. The ISO standard is almost the same, only the form is different and the passport got a bit more fields. If you want to try this yourself, you can already just go to the Jetpack libraries. You can put it into your app, but what I think is really cool is that the identity credential, the whole stack, is open source on GitHub. And it's maintained by another team than Google Wallet. So there are separate teams, separation of concerns, which is, I think, really good. Um, and it also contains a test server. So if you want to hand out like documents, it contains some Python. Uh, I've committed a nice Docker compose file to that, so you can just spin up a server. Uh, download the apps. There are two apps. So if you really want to test the whole chain, you need a server. You need your own phone that holds identity credentials. And another phone where you can check those identity credentials, like your policeman or if you are having a hotel. So I would really recommend on this. And the nice thing is that if you are going to get a digital ID last year, it would be nice to think back like, hey, I already knew this from like five years ago. That, that weird guy from Holland told, told something about that. He didn't say anything on how it works in the code, but he told about the integration. And one key thing is, and I really know that people come here to see the code. I really do. But it's still so experimental and it changes all the time that if I'm going to tell it right now, it might be different in like a week. So that's uh, basically the reason. But if you do have any technical questions, Please come to me after the talk, somewhere in the lounge or something, and uh, ask me. Thank you for coming. My name is Rutger. That's how you pronounce it. No worries, no worries. <laughs> and if you want to know more about this, or read more about this, or reach out to me, please add me on LinkedIn or on, uh, I keep calling it Twitter, but I put in some uh, X in Ariel uh, next to it because uh, people like that. So that's it. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> All right, thank you so much.